Good morning. We're back in Daniel Common's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. We're in chapter number 10. I have to say that this chapter probably opened my eyes to the advantages and disadvantages of small numbers. As a matter of fact, the title of the chapter is The Law of Small Numbers. Now, in this particular chapter, as you all know, in these videos right now, we go straight to the very last section that goes over about the question. So let's get to the quotes at the end of chapter number 10. Here's, here's the first quote. Yes, the studio has three successful films since the new CEO took over, but it is too early to declare that he has a hot hand. He goes over this. There's been actual research done that there's no such thing. So just because a person has initial success doesn't necessarily mean that they're the one. So I often relate this to my own career that the hospital where I came from um, actually had done a lot of groundwork laying up for the success that I had. We had taken on lean strategies. We had taken on process improvement for almost nine years prior to. So the staff of 7,500 was perfectly poised for a diversity, equity, and inclusion program where we had already gotten out of our own way of not being collaborative. We had broken down a lot of the silos, not all of them, but it was perfectly poised for us to work together and work better together. Was that Joe? Probably not. Was that nine to 10 years of laying the groundwork for the success of Joe? Most likely. <laughs> right? It's not in and of one person ever, a CEO, a president, a DEI person. It's usually some groundwork has been laid that, that enables that success. Second quote, I won't believe that the new trader is a genius before consulting a statistician who can estimate the likelihood of his streak being a chance event. Be aware of this. Whether it's a hot hand in a basketball game or a new CEO who's got three successful films working for the film industry, or it's Joe Conway leading the diversity, equity, and inclusion program for a hospital. It doesn't make any difference. Look at the data, verify that this is not an anomaly or an outlier. Outliers we have a tendency to gravitate towards and say, wow, look at the success of this individual and they're new in this position. Number, quote number three is the sample of observations is too small to make any inferences. Let's not follow the law of small numbers. Be careful here. You know, I've looked at a lot of surveys over the years and even we did a, a survey here locally that only had roughly 250, 300 participants. Now it all depends on what you're going after. We were going after underrepresented populations. We were going after people that lived in a certain particular census tract within Wilmington. So we weren't concerned about the other census tracts. We really wanted to hear from this particular one. And in cases like that, well, the population in that area was only like 1,500, 3,000 tops. So your sample size going in is going to be small. But as long as you understand that one of your disclaimers is that this cannot be a total representation of all of the area that you're looking at, you're fine. This will be a piece of information, what statisticians or scientists often call an artifact of what you're trying to prove. And you may or may not be able to prove your hypothesis, and that's okay. This is just another cog in the system as long as you don't base your entire report on this one artifact in your overall facts of your study. And then finally, he says this in the final quote, I plan to keep the results of the experiment secret until we have a sufficiently large sample. Otherwise, we will face pressure to reach a conclusion prematurely. This is actually wise. So many times when we realize that our sample size may be small, it may not be totally representative of what's going on, we may want to hold that information back until we can increase the sample size to make it make sure it does have full representation of what we are trying to prove. Because in fact, a hypothesis is just that. It's something that we say, hey, look, this could be true. This is what I'm going to attempt to prove, but I don't know if it's true until I actually put the test to the sample. So 
in these particular cases, just be cognizant of that very fact. And if you need more data, don't be ashamed to go back and go get it. Now I will say this, especially when it comes to, let's think of my world and perhaps your world of diversity, equity, and inclusion. What you want to do though, is you do want to keep the participants informed. One of the biggest mistakes of any type of DEI survey is often holding that information so close to the chest that you forget to tell people. You forget to tell the very people that gave you information where you are in the process. And this will always lead to mistrust. So yeah, you want to be careful here to make sure that if you need more time, tell people that you need more time. Tell people that your sample size is not representative of what uh, you know, you're trying to prove or disprove, right? Make sure that you keep people informed along the way. So this is chapter number 10, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. I'm really enjoying the book. I hope you buy it and you read it for yourself because there's so much more in this chapter. This is one of those chapters I would actually get you to slow down and perhaps read two or three times because we all dwell in this space of where we need data. And many times we're putting out information that just ain't right. Have a good day.